let's not forget that uh, that's actually been the tactic of U.S. imperialism within the last 50 or so years. Like, if you, there was a turning point where in World War II, like in the lead up to World War II, um, the way the U.S. slandered socialism and communism was based on fear and based on uh, on making them seem radical, right? Like communists are radical extremists, subversives, like they're trying to, the Reds, they're trying to bring down the country. Then they realized something, okay, we got to switch that because that actually brought more people to communism and socialism. Because then you're like hyping it up, right? You're like, yo, this group of people, they're crazy. Like they're going to change change society. And they're like, yeah, I want that, you know? Yeah. But it's like, so they were like, okay, we're going to flip it. And so after World War II, uh, with the 60s and the, the rise of the hippie movement and the counterculture and postmodernism and, and identity politics and all this stuff, like they were able to, the CIA like literally invested millions and millions of dollars into these think tanks and small little liberal groups in California, all over the US uh, as the Congress for Cultural Freedom, as like the, the new left that was like, oh, we're against, you know, the Soviet Union, we're socialists and we're feminists, but we're against the Soviet Union, we think the Soviet Union should be dismantled. You know, we're against Cuba, we're against, you know what I'm saying? And so they use that like branding of like, like bourgeois feminism and like liberalism to oppose like actually existing socialist countries. And so I think they're kind of like a, a 21st century continuation of that, where they're putting, using women of color as tokens, as, as, as puppets in a way to advance their imperialist agendas um, and presenting those who oppose them as like conservative and, 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 and cold. You know, for example, like the whole Tiananmen Square stuff, that's a perfect example of how the US imperialist uh, narrative about socialism has changed. Because before it used to be like communism was and socialism was portrayed as the person like resisting or, or fighting. And now they switched it where it's like socialism is no longer human, it's a tank, it's a cold tank that's running over an, a, a liberal creative individual, you know, and it's like, and that, and so that they were, Democrats were the ones who mastered that and they're continuing that strategy. And I think like AOC, using AOC, using Ayani Presley, all these people who are so-called socialists to attack real socialists in the global South. I think that strategy works very well for Democrats. And I think that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about that? I mean, I've, I actually, the, the, the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Yeah. Who was that? So my friend Caleb, um, my longtime friend Caleb Moppin, he he uh, he's an independent journalist. He's been doing a lot of research on it, and uh, and I've read a lot of his stuff about it, his research on it. Um, but basically, in the like in the, after World War II, the CIA uh, needed to switch up its tactics in terms of subverting the Soviet Union and bringing it down. And one of the the tactics, one of the commissions that they created, and you can look this up. This is actually on the CIA. Like website itself, like that, that. This is like at this point has been public is public record. Um, they created the Congress of Cultural Freedom, which basically would organize like you know uh, cultural events in the Soviet Union that were like postmodern and stuff like that. They would have like like splats of paint, and it's like oh we're unique and different because you had like the for example like one of my favorite artists Siqueiros from Mexico, right? Who is a, a Mexican uh, muralist, a socialist. Re that's socialist realism where he's portraying the images of people, working class people, that hu humans look like humans, it has a message, it has a goal, it's art for the people, right? It's a communist art. So that's like, for me, like that, that's like more like uh, better art, it's better art. And so the postmodernists, the liberals, they started creating this abstract art. And so the Congress of Cultural Freedom started doing that. It's like, they started um, basically trying to push as much postmodernism, media, hosting conferences, pamphlets, leaflets, into the Soviet Union uh, to portray the Communist Party as like conservative and and backward, and they don't want to adapt to the new change. Um, you have the Tavistock Institute, which was like the institutes that was uh, doing experiments with LSD and drugs and like Woodstock and shit like that. And you had the rise of this hippie left um, in the U.S. that was in large part uh, supported by the Congress for Cultural Freedom, Ramparts Magazine, like Contrapoints Magazine. Um, you know, the rise of like Noam Chomsky. Uh, and, and there's people who, the rise of this new left in the US that uh, was very connected to the CIA left, the State Department left. And they were used to oppose, like for example, the Sandinistas to oppose like Angola. And, and so, you know, I think the Congress for Cultural Freedom, we have to really understand. I suggest checking out my friend Caleb's uh, work on it. He's done a lot of coverage about it and research. 
But if you look it up, Congress of Cultural Freedom, it's crazy. Like they they did all this stuff. And now that manifests itself in the form of like the National Endowment for Democracy, for example. Uh, Carl Gershom, who is the president, let me just get his name because um, he, um, he is the only president, uh, Carl Gershman, the National Endowment for Democracy, he's the president. He's been the president since like Reagan era. Mm -hmm. He was actually a quote unquote socialist. He was in like a Trotskyist group in the US, um, the U Young Socialist League or something like that. That it was one of part of that group of Trotskyists that were supported by the State Department. A lot of Trotskyists who became neocons, Irving Kristol, uh, a lot of, you know, and, and they formed part of that new left in the US where they were like, you know, they were the ones who got professor jobs. They were the ones allowed in mainstream media as long as you oppose the Soviet Union, but on socialist grounds. You know, you don't, that they, they figured out the strategy of beating back uh, communists with democratic socialism. Right. Right, so no, this is really fascinating. I, I, I've actually never heard of the, the Congress for, for Cultural Freedom. I, mean, I, I knew, I'm just looking it up right now, I knew Jackson Pollock was connected to the CIA. That I knew. So I get, this is, this is just, I, I don't know, maybe I didn't, I, and I, met, I, 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 you know, I never imagined that was an isolated thing. So like, so that kind of, okay, this makes a lot of sense. So a lot of, a lot of this kind of postmodernist kind of um, what are facts, you know, like, you know, let us inter a ruthless interrogation of our own, methodological imaginary right <laughs> or the fuck they're saying these politics really really do actually emanate from the state department no? yeah oh definitely definitely that's where it comes from and uh even like the opposition you look at the opposition protests in venezuela same thing right the same model and they were funded by the ned carl gershom and and that whole crew of the congress of cultural freedom uh the the opposition protests in nicaragua uh, that they use the branding of environmentalism and even try to uh, hire what like a few indigenous people in Nicaragua and be like, oh, these are indigenous people resisting um, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and using them as basically like props, you know? And, uh, and, and that's been the tactic is like, we're gonna attack the left from the left or from the synthetic left. And it's been very successful and people still fall for that shit all the time. You know, the hashtag SOS Venezuela as well as Nicaragua, Cuba. Um, and uh, it's something that we have to really keep an eye out for because imperialism is constantly adapting. And it's one of the mistakes, like I, I think one of the mistakes the left makes is they don't adapt to the new conditions and uh, take in like try new methods of organization. You know, they're still acting like it's 1920s and you can go to a street corner and like yell and, and hand out a, a leaflet and be like, workers of the world, you know? Yeah. Like, it's not, we're not in that time period anymore. And we have to adapt our agitprop to the new conditions. We have to organize people in new conditions. The imperialists understand that and they understand that better than us on the left. And so, and part of that has been like using the strategy of the attacking the left from the left. And I think that the Congress of Cultural Freedom, the NED, all that is so important to understand. But I, I really feel like the things from the 70s, the 80s, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, that, 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 you know, the time period which NED was formed and many of the things are going on with the NED to this day, like all across the world, they're very sophisticated. A lot of what's going on today you know, it's coming out of the academy and postmodern kind of stuff like that is it, it, it's it's getting so nakedly ridiculous. I mean, it's just getting absurd to the point where people are developing this like, set of politics where it's like, I'm right because I'm me. And I'm yeah. right about everything because I'm me. <laughs> how dare you? I mean, no, how I'm, dare I'm, you, Matt? <laughs> I've been having these arguments with people. Someone told me that you yeah. know, someone told me the nation state was founded on whiteness, and like, and then that yeah. was it. And like, and that's the the definitive statement. The nation, like, you guys are nationalists, and the nation state was defended on whiteness. I don't want to hear anything, you trash man. <sighs> but my, my response to that is to like post a picture of Oscar the Grouch. Like that doesn't work with me, right? But like, <laughs> but but the thing about that is that you know, like the idea that like let's take that for instance. Someone saying the nation state was founded on whiteness, like so. I mean, I guess you could argue that early European nations uh, were founded on colonialism. I mean, like the, it, they, they drew their borders, like in the in the in the 16, 17, 1800s, right, on the basis of like capturing their markets and stuff like that. So there's that. But if it was founded on whiteness. Why would there be why would there be a bunch of countries in Europe if it was just <laughs> if it was just like right, right, yeah. nation state? And so, the, well, why are there many nation states in Europe? I mean, first of all, that doesn't make sense. Uh, I mean, I, I'm getting into like personal stuff right now, but but the point is like these. The, it, lines of argumentation that make no sense and cannot be challenged or you're done. It is just 
is, yeah. is, is what this has devolved into. I mean, at least Jackson Pollock could like explain why his painting was good. I mean, I don't know if it was any good, but he could explain like he, he gives some kind of semblance of an explanation. Right. But, no, that's a, that's a good point that you raise, and I think part of that is the failure, the the purposeful uh, erasure of a real Marxist scientific outlook. Because yeah. when you when you like, I remember when I first started getting into leftism, I was like, damn, like it's all these like hippies, and it's all about just like counterculture and blah blah. blah. And then like once you actually read like like dialectical materialism and Marxism, the science of Marxism you see that it's a certain outlook and, and you have to have a certain, um, a scientific way of understanding the world. And I think the reason that unfortunately many people are like that, um, who are the how dare you people, is that they are, they don't have a, a scientific Marxist approach. They, um, that hasn't been taught to, and that's, and that going back to the Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, conversation we're having right now, that was part of it um, is, is deleting, erasing the contributions of Marxist theoreticians uh, about philosophy, about how Marxists understand reality, and replacing it with um, idealism and radical subjectivism. So, for example, as communists, as as materialists, we understand that material reality determines consciousness. So, your 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 economic class, your your position within capitalism determines uh, events in society. And so like you can't understand whiteness without understanding capitalism and imperialism as the base, as the core. Um, but for a lot of the postmodernists, they see it in it as race is the primary thing or, or, or gender or everything else but class. And that was one of the techniques that the Congress for Cultural Freedom uh, used. There was a term uh, that, uh, that you probably have heard and uh, that is called uh, uh, economic reductionists. That yeah. people who like, like it's it's a term that liberals use it uh, a lot of times again. And, and and that's not to say I'm only view it in a class way. Obviously, as someone who's like from Latin America and the Caribbean, I think black and indigenous people should be uplifted. I think LGBTQ people should be uplifted. Uh, but my primary understanding of society is through proletariat and bourgeoisie, the classes, class struggle. And that's been kind of erased from Marxism uh, where it, it's all subjective. And, and the other component of Marxist science is understanding uh, objective reality. There is such a thing as objective reality. The sky is, uh, you know, is objectively there. Like we objectively move around the sun. Like there are things that are independent of whatever we think. But a lot of the postmodernists, they're like, well, it's my truth, my truth, my. It's like, no, it doesn't work like that. Like there's the truth. And as communists, our goal is to understand what the truth is and use it to liberate our class and our people. And so it, we've devolved into this era where not only do people think that truth is relative, that truth is whatever you think it to be your truth, but they also uh, don't understand that economics and your position within the capitalist mode of production is what determines everything else. You know, a capitalism created slavery and racism, not the other way around, you know? And, and so it's like, we, we have to understand it like that. And I think it goes, it connects with what we were just talking about, about like the subversion of Marxism, the same way hip hop was subverted, you know, from its revolutionary roots, like in the eighties and shit, like once the, the cocaine started coming in from the Contras, they started flooding the hood with cocaine, subverting hip hop, subverting all this culture. They've done the same with Marxism. And it was around the same time too, where they started promoting hippie culture. They started promoting like radical subjectivism where it's like, oh, anything is true, um, you know, and so as communists, we have to like really go back to our roots and understand the, the real science of Marxism. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it, you know, when we talk about like, you know, the Latin kind of American dash, dash like people living here in the States, I mean, like the poverty rates we experience are really high. You start disaggregating that information, you know, like, uh, you know, I come from, you know, my background, I'm, you know, Mexican. Um, I, I know you're Honduran. So, I mean, like a lot of the different groups, if you look at them specifically, are experiencing uh, rates of poverty at a very, very, I mean, I looked at this one time, but not that long ago, and I think that the Honduran uh, uh, rate of, of poverty in the, in the U.S. is like tonight, 24% of Honduran Americans living in poverty. Um, and and for, for, uh, for many of I think it was like 20, I think it was like 20, I think it might have been 25, 26, some of that, so it was, it, was, it was around the same. Look at the literacy rates, look at this, all these things. These are economic questions, you know, the, the, and our, our place within the economy is like, I mean, it, it's how we live. I mean, when we talk about the economy, we talk about class. It's not distinct from like who we are and who our parents were, or whatever. And it's, it's a the class reductionist thing is ridiculous. It's just a it's it's an absurd way of of of, um, 
of moving the conversation away from from economy, which is how we live. 